Welcome to the Blueprint Podcast, where we throw out the old blueprints so you can become who you were always meant to be. I'm your host, Jason Smith, and if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button and share this podcast with your friends on social media and tag me in it at jbirdfit. Today, I have a very special guest for you, Jack Donovan. Jack Donovan is an American author, speaker, and influential voice in the realm of masculinity and men's issues. Best known for his books, The Way of Men and A More Complete Beast, Donovan explores the themes of strength, honor, and the traditional roles of men in society. His work encourages men to embrace their primal nature and cultivate a sense of purpose and integrity. Donovan's philosophy is rooted in the concept of tribalism and the importance of brotherhood, advocating for men to build strong, supportive communities. In addition to his books, Donovan leads the men's group Order of Fire, where he fosters a community of men dedicated to personal development and mutual support. He has also contributed to various publications and appeared on numerous podcasts and speaking engagements, sharing his insights on masculinity, culture, and personal growth. His thought-provoking ideas continue to inspire and resonate with men seeking to reclaim their identity and live authentically. Jack Donovan, welcome to the Blueprint Podcast. But you came at a recommendation from an online friend of mine. We've never actually met, but he and I have done some stuff in terms of my men's group and some other things that I've been doing. Uh, Graybeard Actual, his name's Ray Gardner. He suggested that I read The Way of Men. And course he said by jack donovan and you you hear that name and it's just yeah of course i'm gonna read the way of men by jack donovan because that just sounds like (laughs) a really freaking awesome name but that makes sense let's dig into it and as i was going through it you just you start listing off all these things that i think are a very typical experience for many of us that are out in the world just trying to we're get we're getting by we're surviving we're doing the best that we can we're trying to figure things out we're trying to figure out where we fit in into the world. We feel separate from the way things have been going on. I think many of us are going through this constant struggle to figure out who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? And the why behind why I'm doing it. Another thing that I saw today, and it really goes well with the end of your book, A More Complete Beast. And this guy was talking about, his name's Paul Chamberlain, smart, funny, tortured on Instagram. And he cited Vesperance, a wistful recognition of an era gone and an unknown future on its way. Yeah, it just it hits you. And I'm like, that's interesting. Of course, I dig a little bit deeper and I find something on Reddit. And I think this will really paint the picture for where I want to go with this podcast, this hour that I have with you. And it's the golden hour of an era. And you're acutely aware that you're riding the last rays of a setting sun. You look around and you see the world in the simplicity of the now, cognizant of the tectonic shifts on the horizon. And in that instant, you're both a poet and a prophet. You feel a sense of loss for this beautiful and perfect world that doesn't even know it's already a memory. Yet there's a thrill, a pulse of electric anticipation for the unfathomable future that's rushing towards you. Vesperance is the emotional echo in that liminal space where the nostalgia for what's behind you is tinged with the exhilarating unknown of what lies ahead. And that came from Mask of Man on Reddit from an article uh, that was printed off in Medium. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on Vesperance. It sounds like a lot of things that I've been describing and other people have been describing. Yeah. Just whether you're talking about the end of the West or you're talking about different golden ages or your perception of golden ages or so forth. Oddly, I've never heard that word. I'm a, I'm a word nerd, and so I'm surprised. Yeah. Vespers, I think, it has to be something. You know, I think in music, it's a great, great little passage that yeah. someone wrote out. It, I do try to warn against golden age mentality. One thing that I've done in the past year is I've spent a lot of time with uh, classical philosophy. I, I went to Athens last year. And uh, on my live show with a good buddy of mine who's really into Homer. And we just finished a, an eight week reading of Plato's Republic. And I just went, re- did a really big deep dive into that. One thing that I really got out of a lot of the study is to realize of how uh, tumultuous things always are. And we, we feel, obviously, I think everybody, especially since 2020, everyone feels that, <laughs> that like the world is coming out part at the seams and what's, you know, we don't know how to plan for the future and things like that. So it becomes very stressful in a sense, but it gave me a little bit of a sense of peace. We talk about cancel culture and then you read about Socrates 
basically getting tried and forced to commit suicide because he made the bad arguments seem good. <laughs> you know, right. but he was corrupting the youth. And uh, I actually got to visit, uh, they actually know where the Athens prison is, where he totally, where, where he actually committed suicide. And so there's that spot there in the center of Athens. So I visited that. And it's just, it, the way things feel right now, I think it's a function of the media that we see news constantly. We've, but there's always been upheavals. If you look at the time period, I'm not a, a super big history guy, but if you look at the time period that, think of this great age of philosophy, of Plato and, and Socrates and all these people walking around in, in robes and talking about high-minded things. And there were wars going on all around them and changing factions. I saw something recently that said Plato might have ended up being sold as a slave later in his life. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to confirm that, but it was like a report that they think they'd found like where he was buried. That's like kind of a new thing. But yeah, all these guys were going through so much, you know, the world was changing around them constantly. And I think in America, we have this sense that we lived through a century. You want to say we had the Civil War. Right. And there, there was World War One, World War Two, which that was overseas things. But we've had this era of a few generations of real prosperity and freedom from worry, really. And that's probably historically atypical. You go through brief periods of that, but things keep changing, and we have to. So I don't know. It gave me a sense of okay, this is how it always is. To a certain extent, it's, you get a little bit of period of, of everything be nice, and we were just lucky enough to be born into. We're not boomers. We weren't born into a generation where you could buy a house for a dollar and then right. the entire get like a million. And then you constantly and, get reminded of that, and it's why can't you do the same thing? There's a lot of reasons why we can't. Things. It's a little different. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We weren't in, born into that era, but we were still born into relative prosperity. Yes, and and it's, we were lucky, and so things keep changing. Yeah, it's so interesting. I think so many of us look back on 2020 and really just before 2020, we're stuck in that framework and that mindset of, I want to get back to this place. I want to go back to the way things were. I want to get back to the way that I felt then, or they never really shifted into 2024. I hear this a lot from people where they're like, yeah, it just, I feel like I've lost four years of my life and all of a sudden I'm forced to start thinking about, am I going to move forward? What am I going to do now? I don't really have a path laid out for myself because I've been expecting things to go back to this normal that is now gone and it's not coming back. I think a lot of people are waiting to see, obviously, this is going to be a year that's going to decide a lot of things. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Where are we going? What do I have to, <laughs> what do I have to, what am I going to have to put up with? What am I going to have to like, how am I going to have to arrange things so that I can still live the way that I want? All these things are the questions that I have personally. And I think everybody else has them too. And unless there are a lot of people that are just like, nothing happened. Everything is okay. But there, there is a lot of that as well. But I think those of us who have our eyes open to things uh, that are going on in the world, okay, some bad things might be coming. And how do I plan for that? You know, and, or how do you just, I'll deal with it when it happens. You know, a lot of, I see a lot of entrepreneurs and so forth. They're, they're like, they're just out there. Let's go make money while I can kind of thing. So that's probably the best way to handle a lot of it rather than that. Yeah. I like what you say. And that's to be a creator. I think yes. for, for so many of us, we're in this place where it's so easy to look at all these other things and to blame and to cast hate, to be frustrated and to live in this place of resentment and this mm -hmm. feeling of, I can't get there. I can't have that. I can't be that person. And we have all these core beliefs that are really somebody else's voice from the past that's been ling lingering through the epigenetics of our family line and gets tossed around from generation to generation. Now you're sitting here trying to navigate that, but you're stuck in your own stuff on top of that. How would you help somebody navigate that feeling of stuckness and the resentment that they're going through? Resentment is a big topic that I've written a lot about. The More Complete Beast is, is basically about overcoming resentment which resentment is an easier way to say it. The resent, resentment is the French that Nietzsche used. And this idea that, especially the your resent, resentment is basically this jealousy that you have about people who are above you. We, I just did it with the boomers. But the, it's jealousy that you have. But it, resentment specifically is about a jealousy that you want to see them punished for being successful. And you want the people who are above you to be punished for being successful. And I think we see that with a lot of, young men, especially who have, think that the world is supposed to be a certain way and it's not. Yeah. And therefore they're mad 
at everybody for taking that away from them, the thing that they think this entitlement really that they have, that the world is supposed to be in a certain way. Like I'm supposed to have, you know, a wife by 20 and there's all these things that they think they're supposed to have. That's not the way the world is right now. So it's the idea of letting go that you have to have this, I guess this sense of entitlement, which is maybe people that I disagree with about everything else would use, but there is a sense of entitlement there that, that feels like I deserve this but you didn't do anything to get it. Like you have to let that go. That sense that you deserved something as Clint Eastwood would say, deserves got nothing to do with it. But uh, yeah, I think just letting go of that is important. And then realizing like, how can I be positive within that frame of moving forward rather than it's, the thing is men are thumotic and we're angry about injustice. And I don't think it's wrong at all. Especially young men are very angry about injustice. And I'm angry about injustice all the time. But you have to separate that from being angry just because they, from other people, because they're doing better or angry because people won. Focus, it's good to be angry about injustice and, and to never let that go. I'm on the, as far as the 2020 stuff goes, I'm on the never forgive, never forget page. It's not that I'm like one of these peaceful guys who's like, no, everything's cool, man. I'm angry about things. <laughs> but at the same time, you have to not let that overcome you and overtake your whole personality. Yeah, you talk a little bit about having a sphere of influence. I think that goes really well here in terms of what we're able to impact physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and in, in, in the world, and to go out and to be the type of person that you really want to be. But I think many of us don't know how to figure out, well, who am I supposed to be? So what type of guidance would you give to somebody on that? There's a lot of people who are looking for someone to give them meaning in life. Yeah. Someone's like, they're like, look, they, they always say, you know, searching for meaning, trying to find meaning in life. Well, everybody's but, always you know, looking for purpose. Yeah. Pr a purpose. Like what's my goal? One of the things I, for a lot of people, your goal doesn't necessarily like, like one day I wake up and I'm like, I have a purpose in life. <laughs> and I think they get this from a lot of entrepreneurs. You read a lot of these books and you're like, you have to have a mission and a purpose and all this. And uh, do you think the average guy in, in most of human history had a meaning and a purpose like this, this driving for it? Probably not. You know, that's, that seems pretty unlikely. So there's keeping that in mind, but one of the best ways to get a sense of meaning and purpose is to see some, someone else who is doing something that you believe in and think is good. Yeah. And then try to help that person do that thing in, in whatever way that you can, whatever you can bring to the table, whether that's personally, or whether that's supporting someone who's doing something, whatever. And then as you do that over time, it, on, almost as an understudy, you may see that there's a need that isn't being filled. Like, oh, he's doing this thing and that's good. But here's another way that you could do that. And then that's how you find your individual, I think, niche, like who I am, what my message is, what am I doing? And, and you constantly have to refigure that out because the world keeps changing. Like I'm doing that now. It's like I was writing about one thing for a really long time. And then, but the world has changed. So what do you write about now? What, what do you talk about now? What's important? But you just have to keep evolving as that goes. And people are finding that out, especially with technology and stuff like, oh, AI, I just took my job. There's all kinds of stuff going on right now. And you just have to keep changing all that. So the idea that you're going to have one purpose in life, some guys get that. But I think that it's more to just find what you believe in, what you think is, is good and move in that direction. And then more things will reveal, it, so reveal themselves to you. I've been talking a lot about I've been reading about Dharma, which is, I'm not a big Eastern religion guy, but the, it's, it, it, there's this discussion of Dharma that ha, that's in this one epic story from India and the Ramayana. The way he, they talk about Dharma is in two ways. There's an order of the universe, and then there's the right order for you based on your station in life, based on what's happened to you, based on your family history, based on all these things. Here's what is right and wrong for you. You're like your correct path is Dharma really is the way, they, the way it's explained. And for their, their demons in the story who have Dharma, they have their own Dharma. It's natural for demons to eat people and eat, drink their blood. So that's fine. They're not out of Dharma for doing that. It, so it's right. this idea that you have based on all everything that you like your natural talents, for instance, like things that you're good at, things you're not based on that. What direction can, you, can I be moving in because of that? Your natural, what kind of personality do I have really? You know, what things can I change and what things are probably not going to change? You have to go look on all that and get, kind of create your character. And that, that's something I like to talk about a lot too, is just like, what is your character? Like if you had to, I like to hang out with guys who could easily be drawn into comic books. 
Like <laughs> like a graphic novel. Like I, I have a bunch of friends. You could draw that guy into a graphic novel in five five minutes. You know exactly who that guy is, what his character is, and what he's doing. There you and go. I think that could actually be a useful thing. And I might write about that in the future. A useful idea to almost do if you had to create a character for a fictional novel or a movie or something like that. Like, what is your character? Then things start to fall in place. What would my character do? What would he do in this situation? And then do that. <laughs> and that's harder. That's you know, easier said than done. But as you start to get a sense of self in that way and create who you want to be, and people always think that's fake if you're creating, like, you should just be yourself. But I think a lot of people are stuck in the idea that being myself is like whoever I was in high school or whoever I was as a young adult or whatever. And no, it's, you can create, you, you know, put yourself in the driver's seat and create this person. And that's the opposite of fake because who's creating it? You're creating it. So you just create this person and obviously you want to be authentic and not just be faking things, but they move in a certain direction. And I like what you said there, because we're looking at the scale of things. And I think a lot of people would be better served to understand who they are on this planet. When you look at things more globally, you have to look at what can I impact? Can I create or affect any type of change in this scenario that is far beyond me or something that's happening on the other side of the planet? And right. the reality is no, but there is the butterfly effect to some degree where when you focus on your sphere of influence and you focus on becoming more of yourself and you put that effort into yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, we get a, on the topic of healing and I got to go do shadow work and do all these things. Great. Fine. Wonderful. Love that for you. Do all of that and then treat people the way that you desire to be treated. Ultimately, go out into the world, do great things be a creator, be a co-creator, right? Know when to step back and allow other people to lead in certain scenarios. What you're going to realize is that has a ripple effect, not only throughout your life, but throughout time, especially as you decide to have children, or maybe you don't, but you're still going to impact people in different ways. Again, from I always, you see me move my hands because I'm picturing the circle around me, that 15 foot circle that I'm able to impact in my world in my reality because that's the space that i have to be impactful for other people and of course social media gives us uh, a little bit more reach in that regard but we don't really see the tangible results of that i think you do because you have what is that order of fire your men's group yeah so you get to see it from a, a very different perspective and i was hoping you could share with us a little bit more about order of fire and what that's all about Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. First, I, I love what you're saying about the sphere of influence. That is that most people, I used, to know, I used to know a guy who said, if you can't get the president of the United States to change the color of his tie, then you actually don't have very much influence on the world. But if you really worked at it, could you get him to change his tie? No. So all, all these things that we worry about that aren't in our sphere of influence, if we can worry about your friends, worry about your family. Don't worry about what's happening overseas. Don't worry about all these other things. That'll give you, you're going to have more connected relationships with the people around you to begin with. So that's great. For sure. The Order of Fire is basically, I came up with an idea in my book, Fire in the Dark. And my book, Fire in the Dark, creates this philosophy of solar idealism. And you'll see me say, stay solar. And that's my slogan for things. And it, it's a good the short slogan. form of it, yeah, yeah. The short, the idea of it was really like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. If you look at leaders of men, whether you're talking about being a father or you're talking about being a CEO or a leader of men in some, in whatever way, they're giving off a lot of energy and they're drawing people to them. And the people who are drawn to them get something out of it. They're like they're getting better rather than getting worse. I always say it's like difference between the sun and a black hole. A black hole like just takes everything into it. And there are a lot of leaders who are like that, who will just suck everyone dry around them or they're leaders for a short time. They're not really, leaders is not a great word for them, but that's what will happen, like bad cult leader. But a really positive man is going to have these circles around him, like planets basically that are basically feeding off of his light and his energy and warmth and everything that he has to offer. And so the idea of trying to be that guy is I think a very a good direction to send people in. And so that's why it's become one of my slogans. But solar idealism is a step further in dealing with the Nietzsche and death of God concept. And what do we do when all these, all these different, we, people used to live in these tribal realities that now we live in this world where we can see everything. And that's created, it was creating problems in the 1800s. It's creating problems now because we're, humans are organized to live in small groups. 
And that's just how we're wired. And the idea that we can see all these different ways of life and all these different religions and all these different ideas is very disorienting to them. And so the idea of solar idealism from a masculinity standpoint was to like building on the way of men. What is this central thing that we care about? Masculinity, whatever. And then what are the mythic patterns that repeat over and over again? So rather than saying, oh, there's Thor and Thor is the one true <laughs> warrior God, right? That actually they're all the same. Do you know how many thundering sky gods there are who throw lightning bolts? It's, it's amazing. Right. It's a, it goes around the world. And let's look at that. And look at, let's look at that big pattern. And the same thing with like the idea of a father in the sky. There's always a father in the sky. That's going to a pattern that repeats over and over again. So let's look at that. What is that? And, and then, then most of our lives are about perpetuation. Really, that's 90%. Everybody, men always want to focus on this, like this striker ideal, this warrior you know, God figure. They want to be thinking about that. But most of us are not doing that for any or very little of our lives. Like we're not out there like slaying dragons every day. But what a lot of what we have to do is just keep things going. Okay. Like I got, apparently I need to up date my renter's insurance. It's just all this, all the work that you need to do in life to just keep things going, whether it's relationships, things, to, movies that you don't want to watch because someone else wants to watch them, like things like that. You, there's so much stuff that you have to do. It's, we call it the Lord of the earth. So these three different archetypes that I, I lay out in fire in the dark and our idea with the order of fire is basically building off of those ideas. This idea of a becoming a solar force in the world having some kind of point of orientation, which is what the sun is. It's an axis that everything circles around. So having your own system of values that you care about instead of receiving them from outside and figuring out what those are. So we do a lot of philosophy and, and then we do a lot of reading about mythology and talking about that. And then our central ritual that we do is a fire ritual, which I made up and I am doing in two days. We're going to go out and shoot some guns and do a fire ritual. So that's, so that's my weekend, but that's time. basically. Hey, it's a great guys coming in and, and hanging out with them. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept because it's very, you really have to get what we're doing <laughs> to, to be right. in the order of fire, but that's where I'm going with it. And I think it's a cool idea, like the idea of creating new myths and new ideas that then reflect our time. Because all these things that from the past really were just reflecting what they needed at that time and what it, based on their environment and the things around them. They were, and so like, how can we create things that make sense for us right now. What do we need? What does make sense for us right now? In a um, world that seems to be turned upside down, depending on your perspective. Th there's no one answer to that. <laughs> like for in the system, it, for instance, one of the things I wrote about in Fire in the Dark was like men probably don't need female role, role models right now because that's being pushed down their throat in every like part of culture. They they don't need to get in touch with their feminine side. That's that's they're already there. <laughs> Most men are like raised by women and and taught by women in, in school, and they're surrounded by women. They they need to get in touch with the bigger idea of men. Like not just obviously they need to have men around them. I think men feel insecure, and I've been saying this for twelve years. Uh, a lot of men see seem very insecure in the modern world, and they are because they don't have a male group of friends. Yeah. Like once you get out of high school or college, it, that's hard to find. Uh, and you really have to have a male peer, peer group. And that's, they let you know who you are to a certain extent. If you're just alone by yourself trying to figure out who I am, we react to one another. So what guy do you become in this group of guys? What do you bring to the table? Uh, you know, that, that gives you a sense of identity and it gives you a sense of validation. No, other thing, like I feel good about a lot of things that I did. I've had some pretty cool guys say, Hey, what you said was right. You know, like as far as the way of men and so forth, like I've had special forces guys and black belts and all kinds of stuff. Like, yep, you got it. And I'm like, cool. All right. But that kind of validation from other men, people are like, you shouldn't need out, outside validation. And that's not how humans are. We're social right. animals. And so it's good to have your skills tested and your, whether you're co competing in something or whatever, have that kind of validation. And then you know who you are and where you fit in. And that doesn't mean that you're the top dog in everything because you never really are. But a lot of guys, I, I've met some guys that are pretty close in a lot of things, but they're hierarchical animals and we you know, fit in different ways. And lots of, I have this former Green Beret who uh, I'm friends with, and he would do these reenact, war reenactment groups 
And because he was special forces guy, he thought that everyone always wanted to be a special forces guy. And uh, he was amazed when he did these reenactments that there's a guy who wants to come and do a World War II reenactment and be the cook. <laughs> and be the cook at the day. He's like, it took me a long time to wrap my head around that's, you know, like <laughs> that, that, that someone wants to do that, right? I thought oh, yeah. they all wanted to be the, the superhero warrior. And, but some guys are just like, they're there to be the cook. And uh, yeah, they, yeah, they just have that. That's what they're, that's their dharma, right? They want to fit. That's the role that makes sense to them for who they are. I don't think and I can I, be that, but I can be this. And because I can be this, then I can be in support of the greater good. And so it gives you that sense of purpose. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and it, we need, men can't all be the same guy. We In any group of men, you need the, whatever, the superhero team, like what people need different skill sets. You need all those things to get the job done. And that's the way men have lived for a really long time. So that's finding your place in a group of men gives you a sense of security and, and you know, belonging and identity that I think a lot of men are missing. Yeah. I think that's why you're seeing so many different men's groups popping up. I created my own men's group in January. We just finished our first online session that runs for 12 weeks. The next one begins mm -hmm. in September, but it came out of a need from my social media. And so I have a couple different platforms that I'm working off of. So I've got Jaybird Fit that runs on attachment styles. And so part of the podcast, I bring on therapists, coaches, researchers, authors, people that have written the books on the subject, because a lot of men are in that place of feeling insecure. They're insecure within themselves, but it's rooted in past experiences with their family dynamic. I started getting all these different comments I'm like, this is unexpected because mostly uh, women follow me on that particular page. And then I started seeing more and more men start to chime in and follow and ask questions and, and want to try to figure some of this stuff out because they do feel lost in who they are as an individual. So they're trying to seek out the answers for that. Created the Antara Society to be able to cover that aspect of it. So I think it's really good to see more and more of these groups pop up because they all have their own brand of masculinity as well. I would love to see more of these groups come together. My goal for the September session is to get in touch with at least five other men's groups that are online that want to work with me and then come on and speak to my group and share their perspective and who they are and what they're all about and what their mission and vision is. And I think if we can get to that more collaborative process, uh, it just exposes people to more opportunities to discover their version of masculinity that ultimately works for them for who they are. Yeah, no, that that's great. It's been interesting. Like 15 years ago, I started, I've been, I've been doing this for a while. I'm a little OG in, in the men's space. And yeah. uh, um, like 15 years ago, having men's group was weird. Like that was yeah. not something that was done. Really. Oh, automatic was, rejection like, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, we're not doing that. And, and that was, and that, and so that was not a thing at all. And then you, there were like pickup artists and there were all kinds of things. And that was, they became a thing. And then I think in the mid 2010s, then it, it started to take off. I think that men, I think a lot of them came back from Middle East too. And they realized that things were wrong and that, 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 that maybe men needed to connect on some level. And so it became a lot more normalized and there are a lot more of these men's groups. And I think uh, it would be great to see more of that happen again, because I think there was a real sense for a while maybe like pre-2020, 2020 to 2021, before that, yeah, where there were a lot of different men's groups working together and supporting each other. I went to a lot of conferences where you'd have Christians and pickup artists and all these guys who were like sh totally on different spectrums, but they could all get along and be cool. And then I think um, possibly because a lot of them were in, in some way responding to radical feminism, they were that radical feminist got killed by trans. And so then I think as is the case with men, as the way of men, when they have a superordinate enemy, they all work together. And then as soon as that goes away, they start fighting with each other. <laughs> and, and I've seen a lot of that. I think there's a lot more. And I think the culture of you get views by doing hot takes about other people and yeah. trashing them. And I'm not on that page at all. I don't, you'll never see no. me do that. I, I, and, and, but that's how not, a lot of not a worthwhile work. pursuit. I can tell you that. No, no, it's yeah. it's it's trashy and it, it's it's really just divisive. But you have a lot of guys doing that now because that's that's what gets them views and likes and follows and people popping popcorn. 
Oh and no, I so, see it. And it's just, you're a oh, yeah. fat loser. And then just like, yeah, that's motivating that guy. I'm sure he's he's buying all of it. It's always a, somebody in sales doing that type of stuff, and you're just like, good God, make it stop. Absolutely, not, not Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, it would be good to see more people working together uh, again. I will say another thing that I've seen in terms of men's groups and just different stuff online is a lot of negativity from the aspect of awareness. So we'll put out all of this stuff that's framed in awareness because people leave the planet permanently at their own hand or the hand of another, and they have that experience. So we're going to put these videos out and then you get 34,000 people that like it. There's thousands of comments in there of, yeah, man, this is me. This is my experience. This is what I'm going through. What they don't realize that they're doing is they're wiring in that way of thinking. So they're repeatedly putting themselves in this position to consume all of this stuff and what you consume consumes you. Then every day you're just reliving it over and over and over and over again. And then you try to figure out why am I miserable? Why am I sad? Why am I isolated? Why is why am I feeling all of these feelings? Or why am I completely numbed out and not involved with my family, with my kids, with my job? Why am I completely detached from everything? Look at what you're consuming and then how that impacts your life. It's not good. Yeah, no, absolutely. A lot of people are living in, there are a lot of these kind of groups and ideas out there that teach people to relive their trauma. Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah, that kind of thing. There's a lot of, well, there's a lot in of, in a way, yeah. you become the perpetrator of your own pain in that process yeah. because you're constantly consuming the same type of content over and over. It's framed as awareness. Hey, this is super sad. Yeah, it is super sad, yeah. but you also have, you're present in this moment and you have every ability right now to do something different for yourself. And so you can continue to doom scroll on that particular topic right. or you can go for a walk, you can work out, you can go sit in a sauna, I don't know, do some breath work or meditate or whatever it is for you, journal. There's so many different things that you can do. And instead you're doom scrolling on stuff that's going to leave you feeling miserable. Oh, totally. That's uh, like anger porn too. <laughs> uh, that's a big, that's a big thing. Things that make people angry and they get excited. People get excited about being angry. Yeah. That's, that's a big factor too. Just why are you angry all the time? Oh, well, you, you, same thing. You look at nothing but things talking about people talking about why they're angry. <laughs> hey, yeah. so. If I give you something happy, if I say, hey, man, this is beautiful, T take a moment, just take a breath, observe the sunset, or go stand on the beach and let the waves crash over your feet and just close your eyes for a second and listen to all that sound, people, it's automatic resistance. Yeah, I'm not doing that. It's not sustainable. That's not real life. That's not, you don't know my life. I have all these horrible experiences. And it's just, yeah. bro, again, you can continue to live that way, or you can try mm -hmm. to see the beauty in the situation that you're currently in and the circumstances that you've been given. You can get really good at living this part of your life. And when you get really good at this part of your life, eventually you get to the point where you elevate yourself out of where you're currently at and you get to peer over that wall and see all these different opportunities that are out there for you just because you chose to be a little bit more disciplined in the way that you're living your life and you've been a little bit more consistent and now all of a sudden you've branched out and you can peer over that wall and see that there's actually opportunity for you and new people that you can meet and new situations you can put yourself into. Give us your definition of masculinity and is it in crisis right now? Yeah, basically the way mem was my attempt to figure out what masculinity is. And I think that's what makes it different from a lot of people were uh, selling ideas of how to be a man because it's their idea. It's basically how to be like me or how to be like my dad said you're supposed to be or, or something like that. But I, I just wanted to find out what masculinity is because what I saw and something that's happening now, everybody sees it, but I had some different exposure in life where I was saw it a little bit earlier, I think, is that this idea of we can't define a man uh, was coming. And it's been coming for a long time. And there were all these academics writing about it, like that masculinity isn't real. And that it doesn't exist and it's completely culturally constructed. And uh, that's been happening since the seventies. And so that we've gotten to where we are now through there. And so I felt like men needed to be able to explain what they meant by masculinity coherently, or they were just going to get steamrolled by what was coming. And so I, the idea that masculinity is different in different cultures, there's a lot of differences between like little details of masculinity even from subculture, different areas of your town that you live in or different sports or anything. There's all kinds of different, what they call in that field, uh, in gender studies, they call it masculinities. Um, and that's different 
cultural expressions of masculinity, but there's something, a layer beneath that doesn't change. And that make would make sense for men who were living thousands of years ago, men of every race, men of every different uh, group or religion or whatever, the things that they would agree on, generally speaking, are what we're probably actually talking about when we're talking about masculinity. And not just like, can't be a man because he doesn't smoke the same cigarettes as me, like it, which is a lot of what people do. And uh, But if you really look at what's deeper than that, and it has to do, I think, with our evolutionary history of men in a group. And what did they need from each other to survive? And that, as I, that influences how we still judge each other. Like on this primal level, when you look at a man, you're like, he's not very masculine. You're, if that's your primal brain saying he would not be useful in this particular situation. And women judge men that way too. And not be, they may say that they don't care about that, but they do. And so it's basically, I talk about it as four tactical virtues, strength, courage, mastery, and honor. And they, these are things that men expect from each other. You're supposed to carry your own weight in the group and you need to have you know, strength that it could also be called might in terms of what's not just whether you can, or can power lift. It's about all the different physicality and physical things that you can do. Courage. Men need to know that other men around them are not going to run at, at every instance when they, when trouble happens, are you in this with me or not? And when men see men who are just seem very timid, it bugs them. It bugs them. They don't know why, but it bugs them. You need to be more, yeah, that's what we see effeminacy. That's what we're seeing. We're like, oh, you're being submissive. And that's, so that's one of those things that masculinity encompasses. And then mastery, it's like, we, we expect men to be good at things. We expect them to be competent and have, you know, have some of our ducks in a row, especially by a certain age or whatever. Uh, we're, you know, are you competent? Can you, are you useful in that way? And then the honor. And again, it comes back to the idea that people say you don't need any validation. I'm a lone wolf. I'm whatever. But if you don't value the group that you're in, if you don't value the other men's opinion of you, um, why would they value your opinion? Like they, it, it's a two way street. So if you're part of a, if you're part of a group of men and you're constantly saying, I don't care what anybody thinks of me in whatever way you're expressing that, whether it's being like really effeminate or you're being just flouting the, the values of the group or whatever, by being that guy, you're saying like, we, you're showing them that they can't trust you. Like, because you don't care about their, you literally are saying like, I don't care about your values. So they can't trust you. And so these are things I think that men have always needed from each other in these situations. And I think that when you see men, it's an interesting problem. Like one of the reasons why I came up with the way of men was I did a little like reverse engineering on what masculinity is. When you look at a man two blocks away and you're like, that's an effeminate man. <laughs> what signal is he sending out that's telling you that? Because it's true. You, there, there are dudes you could see like a block away. Oh my. Okay. You're, that is not a masculine man. And so what signals are they sending out? And usually they're sending out like submissive signals, submissive postures, like I don't care about anything, I'm airheaded. There's all these things, yeah. perfect body language, the speech, all these things that we're sending these messages and our primal brains are reading them back. And so that's where masculinity is rooted to me. And that doesn't mean that those being, those tactical virtues are all of being a man. That's not all virtues in life, but those are the ones specific to men that if men don't have them, they're regarded as not being masculine. And so that's, I think that where we can refine what masculinity is on that level. And then all the other things, like what role you play in the group, like we were talking about earlier, what's your role, what your talents are, what, then you get into religion and philosophy and all those things. And those things change. And those the, from the individual, from the culture, all those things change. What kind of clothing is acceptable? That's a huge thing from culture to culture. Like what makes you a man is you could be entirely clothing we're in, but the deeper thing that's beneath that, like I always say a kilt is basically a dress, right? <laughs> but it's not <laughs> like it's the warrior costume of, of a tribe. You could say it's a dress, but it's, they were actually doing the exact same thing as all the other men, but that's what men wear in their culture to represent these values that we're talking about. That's how they display that they're strong men. So, and today many of us just wear under armor and call it good. 
<laughs> Someone said something to me like once, like there's places in the South where if you're not wearing Under Armour, you might as well just have a dress. <laughs> I also think it's like a, it's an age thing because I'm in my mid forties and there's just a yeah. level of, I, I don't care. I don't care. Jeans, t-shirt, Under Armour shirt, shorts, whatever. I'm good with it. Yeah. There's a part of me that's no longer trying. Now, when I go out, it's different. In my daily life, it, it is what it is. I think it's important. That's another thing that happened with masculinity. Men actually did care about how they looked, but it's become, we've in America especially, I think we've lost a little bit of a connection to the arts. Men made most of the art for most of history and a connection to caring about your, our appearance. You can't, we don't do it the same way that women do. It's not, we're not competing. <laughs> you know, we're not competing in the way that they compete with their appearance. But I think using what you wear and what you do communicates something. And again, it's another extension of how would I draw you? What's your character? What are you putting out there to the world? And so I think that's an interesting thing to, to think about. Same thing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, I live in Arizona. It's 105 degrees right now. I spend my life in basically a tank top and then shorts and go to the gym. But that's what right. I'm doing 90% of the time. For sure. Now, it's interesting because you see people like Jordan Peterson and then mm -hmm. Ju Justin Waller, and they're leaning into wearing suits when Jordan right. all the time. But whenever you're in person on a podcast, and I think that's so interesting. And I can tell you, if I had thousands of dollars to put into suits, I would probably be flaunting some really nice suits. But I don't. So Under Armour it is for right now. Yeah. And there's a time and a place for that. Like suits yeah. aren't what normal people wear. A hundred years ago, they were. You know, right. Like if you were a man of a certain station, you wore a suit every day. But now that's not the case. And you, it's not even associated with wealth anymore because you have all these tech millionaires and whatever walking around in t-shirts. And so it's a, it's a very different thing. They're a cool thing, but they're almost an, an artifact to a certain extent. It's a particular selling point for a particular type of guy. Are there any questions that I should have asked you that I didn't, or that you would like to talk more about? I think we got into a couple of things that I'm actually just touching, starting to touch on now in terms of virtue and Dharma. And I'm, that might be my next book. I might, I'll take two years because they always take two years, but it I, I, might be where I'm going. I think one place where people might be a little more curious uh, is sure. your evolution from young Donovan into who you are today. What has that progression really looked like for you? Uh, for me, it's just been continual refinement okay. of uh, everything I was talking about earlier in terms of creating a character and what do you want to, who are you trying to become? And how does that person talk? How does that person uh, behave? What do they look like? And then those experiences actually transform you too. I think when I wrote The Way of Man or maybe a little bit of writing before that, at some point I realized, well, I guess I got to go get punched in the face. So I, as a man in his late 30s, went and started doing boxing for the first yeah. time. And, and now it's, I'm a purple belt in jujitsu. I've been doing some kind of martial arts thing for 10 years, probably. And all those experiences like that's changed me. I, I had an idea of where I wanted to go. And now I have firsthand experience with that kind of thing. And so I have a different level of confidence with it, not in a way, I saw a martial art UFC guy or somebody like that, that say the other day that, you know, when you actually fought or done that kind of thing over time, you know, that it could go any way. <laughs> and you, you, you're, you maybe don't want to get into that. Like, I know what it's like to get knocked out. I like, I, you start to get a sense of being a little bit more reserved about, I know what violence is. So let's not do this right now. And, and that, that has to end at a certain point. There's a point where courage is involved, but Having that kind of physical conversation, I think is really important to men too. And I think so many men are finding it out. And that's one thing that's, of all the bad things that are in the world right now, one of the positive things no one ever mentions really, I brought it up a few times, is that men used to stop exercising in their like 20s. Then you, like, you basically then got a job and worked until retirement. Right. And just let yourself turn into like this increasingly fat kind of unhealthy dude. And that was normal because we were past the area where you just work on a farm until you die. And then you'd be working every day and you probably wouldn't get fat or any of those things. But that was the expectation for a, a few generations of men was that you're just going to let yourself go. And it's been so cool 
even over the past like five to eight years, you see all these guys who were actually late thirties, early forties going and doing jujitsu. Yeah. And they're getting to have that thing that men actually need that thing of what we're having. I'm trying to kill you right now. And you learn so much about guys and how they react about react to different situations. And you learn about yourself. You know, if you have to sit and have that moment where I have this 250 pound guy on top of me and I, I really just want to give him the submission because I, I'm actually getting scared. Like I can't yeah. breathe. I'm getting scared to have that experience over and over again is so important to men. And it's in and that experience of winning and losing and all that, I think. And so there are a lot of men in their thirties and forties right now who are definitely in better shape than their predecessors were at that age. And, and they're going out and doing things. Like I said, they didn't, men didn't play sports in America after you know, high school right. or college. And, and now it's like, you have these guys going out and uh, competing in jiu-jitsu or things like that. And it's a really positive thing that I think has actually happened in culture. We talk all about the negative things, but there's so many men doing that right now that I think it's, it's something that we can be. I agree. It certainly tests you in ways that you've never been tested before. When's the last time most people have been gassed out on something completely where you're just completely exhausted, but it happened in a matter of less than 30 seconds and you're like, what happened? Why am I like this? And then you learn, okay, I got to learn to breathe differently. Right. I got to focus more on nasal breathing and, and take my time and get those deep breaths and allow myself to be in this moment and be present that this isn't necessarily a dire circumstance and to start to trust your skills and abilities in that right. situation. The other thing is just aging differently. It's like yeah. we we look at everybody that came before us and they had, it was almost like it was patterned out, man. It was structured. Like you, you hit a certain age, you hit 40, it's all downhill. You sit in your recliner, you watch TV until you retire, like you retire and die. That's your life. And that's just how it is. You retire, you get a couple of years after retirement if you're lucky, and then you're in the ground. And it's, yeah, but you can actually do some preventative work on that. And it, part of that is doing the physical, mental, and emotional and spiritual work on yourself. And recognizing that you are in control of who you're becoming. And I always yeah. tell people, we're always in a state of becoming, but who you become is always up to you. And so right. you can be the person that sits in a recliner and dies at 65, or you can right. give yourself a fighting chance by getting out in the world and actually... Yeah, and that quality of like, so many things, whether it's mobility, there are certain things that like you're just like, I feel a little old. <laughs> but, yeah. but at the same time, there's so much of it that is use it or lose it. Strength is strength is definitely use it or lose it. And all these mobility things. And I'm just so many excuses that men have. Now it's comical to me when I hear dudes in their early thirties talk about things like this. I'm like, oh, really? You're old. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to be 50 this year in the fall. And, and I'm like, I wrestled last night. I wrestled who is good. <laughs> like uh. with a handful. And like, I, I wrestled like guys in their early twenties all the time and the idea that you could do that dudes a couple of generations ago would be like i can't be doing that now but you can don't, still don't want to throw my back <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly and now it's guys who are in the shape going to the gym and then you're doing things like this and it makes you feel so much more alive and it makes you feel young to be able to do that stuff you still can be like it still takes me a minute to get up off of the floor but sitting on the floor for a minute there's things but yeah. but then i can shoot a single leg <laughs> okay. There's all kinds of things that you can keep going and you can keep progressing and you can keep getting better at, or like you said, like kind of some, you know, mitigation of risk or whatever you can uh, reduce risk by keep keeping these things healthy and moving. And it's like, I, I feel like I'm in much better uh, shape going into 50 than, than, than most people are. And it's just because, you know, I've been working really hard for the past 15 years. Uh, so. And for those of you who are considering jujitsu, uh, give it a shot. Generally, you can go in, you get a freebie, and you they walk you through it. it. It's not, I know it can be scary at first walking into a place that you've never been before, you've never done this, and it's an odd experience, but they walk you through everything, and they take their time with you, and you can observe and watch everything. And then you get to see how people interact with each other. And you're seeing people at all different skill levels, all different age groups coming together in that adult session and interacting with each other and yeah you get to see it from the perspective of yeah that young person they got the speed they also have skill and that causes you to sit back and think okay what can i use here i have strength 
and maybe my tactics are going to be a little bit better in certain areas. And so that can counteract the speed of somebody that's a little bit younger, but you're both challenging each other and you're making each other better. It's that our iron sharpens iron process that so many of us talk about. Absolutely. And it's one of those things that I don't want to be, it, it, it is a cult after a while. If you do jujitsu, then it's, it, it, you become that guy. What, what you really need is jujitsu, but it, it is just a really positive thing for, you look at all these guys and they're laughing. They're trying to kill each other, but they're like laughing and joking around and they're like puppies wagging their tails half the time. Like they're doing something that they're designed to do. And then also what you just said, there's also a great interaction between generations of men that really isn't like appropriate even in any other place. You could have, I could be talking to an 18 year old, be like, maybe you shouldn't do this or you can push harder. Yeah. Like they, there, there's things that you get to have that positive intergenerational experience with younger men that I think is really just necessary for them and necessary for you. But so many just aren't getting in the home right? They come from divorced families and this is their opportunity to have that experience with other men and leaders and coaches and people that are guiding them and helping them to do things that they've never done before and build a skill set in that process. Yeah. And the other thing is that it is, it's an unsolvable problem in the sense that you're always going through periods of feeling like you suck. You're talking about the guy who's coming in the front door and he thinks he sucks and I can tell you that I yeah. think I suck half the time and I've been doing this for five years. So yeah. it's just, there's this endless thing of, I should be doing this more. And why am I, in, why do I suck in this area? And why is this always happening to me? Or what, you just go through these periods of that. So there's just always more learning to do, which is, it, it, there aren't a lot of things like that. Like I go to the gym and I know what to do in the gym. Like I've been right. doing that for 15 years. Uh, you know, I know what to do in the gym, but uh, with jujitsu, it's the problem really never gets solved. <laughs> so it doesn't really get boring. That's cool. Jack, tell everybody where they can reach you and how they can work with you. I'm on Instagram right now. I'm trying to make some more reels because that's what people like. Hey, you're doing really well with yeah. those, by the way. They look great. Thank you. Thank you. I've been working pretty hard on trying to get that right. I'm on Instagram at start the world. That's been my slogan for years. One of my slogans. And my website is jack and you can find all my books on Amazon. And I also have orderfire.com for the order of fire. I'm just trying to build that site out. And we also have, I'm on YouTube. I have a relatively large YouTube channel of kind of older stuff. And then the newer stuff I'm doing with the order of fire. I've been doing a live show. We're taking a break for the next two weeks, but I've been doing a live show uh, for the past you know, six months or so every week on Thursdays. That's, that's, we've been trying to put out information related to the order of fire and solar idealism and this philosophy that I've been developing on that page. How can people access order of fire for that um, live show? For the live show, it is just on the YouTube. If you just look up order of fire, it's there. And so that's, and then in the live category, obviously of YouTube, and there's this whole record of all the shows that we've done. And so we'll be doing that more in another two weeks. It's, we realize it's presidential debates and then 4th of July on Thursday. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, no one's going to watch those shows. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back after that. But uh, yeah, that's been really fun, really philosophical because it's a deep dive on a lot of things. My, my co-host is an electrician who also knows more about classical philosophy than almost anyone I know. See, yeah, it's a good mix. All right, man. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. Your reviews help us reach more people and bring on amazing guests. Don't forget to subscribe to the Blueprint Podcast so you never miss an episode. Share this podcast with your friends and family and others who might benefit from these powerful conversations. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time on the Blueprint Podcast.